Okay, good morning. Still morning. Okay, good. Um, so typically on Thursdays we have lab, but I'm just not quite comfortable with you guys doing lab like we normally do lab in here because it can be kind of a germ swap and I don't want it to be. So for the first at least month or two, I'm going to have you do labs at home. But you need some stuff, okay? So the first part of the semester with respect to lab, we're gonna learn to read maps. Okay, so you guys are gonna need some maps. I need you to take home some maps. So what I have over here are rolls of maps. In this roll, you'll find three maps. And this is what you'll need to do the next three labs. So I want you to take one of these home with you, okay? Couple of rules, gotta have rules. Do not draw on my maps. No drawing on my maps. Don't draw on the maps, okay? Just don't lose the maps. If you lose the map, I'm gonna fail you. Do not lose the map. The problem with the map is that we're going into this digital age, and we're gonna do that in here too. We're gonna learn to read maps on maps, and then we're going to look at maps on computers. But now the government only has maps on computers, and I can't get these stupid paper maps easily anymore. So they're like the last copies on planet Earth. But it's a lot easier to learn to read maps on a paper map. It's really hard to do it on the computer screen. So I want you to have a physical map. So today, you know, if you walk to school or rode your bike and don't want to carry the tube home today, come back and get it. But before next Wednesday, I want everyone in class to take a roll of maps home with them, sign your name here so that I know you got them. And for those of the class that are online, you guys need to come in and come into the classroom and grab a roll of maps and bring those home. So maybe next Tuesday, hopefully everybody will pick up maps by then, I will send out the lab and I'll do a little recording of how to actually do some of the most basic map reading that I'll send out at the same time. And then I'll give you some extra time. I'll probably give you two weeks to do the lab. It won't take more than an hour to an hour and a half, I'm guessing. So you got plenty of time to do it. Don't put it off because you'll have another lab that'll come a week later and then you'll get all backed up on it. But I'll give you some time to get through the first one. So today, what I need everybody to do, and over the next few days, what I need everybody doing, who's taking the course online, is to come in, grab a roll of maps, bring them home, and then wait for the lab and wait for the video. Sound good? Okay. So let's move on. I'd like to finish up the background today. I think we'll be able to do it. And then we will move in for the next month, month and a half, and talk about water. So last class, I think we ended talking about your conception of what the inside of the Earth looks like. Okay, and we've got these zones, as best we know. Because remember, humans haven't physically been anywhere but the Earth's crust. We haven't even been able to drill our deepest hole into the mantle yet. But yet, we think we know a lot about what's going on inside the Earth from a lot of indirect means. We have little pieces of the mantle that volcanoes brought up. We have earthquake waves that go through the Earth and sort of tell us about the density and different kinds of rock down there. We have a magnetic field. That tells us something about what goes on inside of the Earth. We have meteorites, which are probably material from a planet that either blew up or didn't form totally, that may have looked a little bit like what the Earth looks like on the inside. So we've got all this indirect evidence. One of the things I asked you last class is, where does magma come from? And this is one of the biggest misconceptions that we have in all of geology, because we have this pesky, molten outer core down deep inside the Earth. Now remember that outer core is made of liquid metal. And the lava that we have coming out on the surface of the Earth is not liquid metal. It's melted rock, not all that different than what we have here on the Earth's surface. What this diagram here is showing is that magma is actually created really close to the Earth's surface when you think of the Earth as a planet. So it generally comes from the upper part of the mantle, base of the crust. We know that from earthquake waves. 
We know it from the kind of rocks that the magmas and lavas bring up from depth. So magma tends to be created pretty close to the surface of the Earth, top of the Earth's mantle, base of the crust, not the outer core. The outer core cannot rise up to the Earth's surface <clears throat> because it's more dense than the rocks that sit on top of it. Magma is a little less dense than the rocks that sit on top, so it's able to rise up buoyantly to the Earth's surface. Okay, any questions on that? All right. A couple other terms that you may or may not run across. If you take more geology classes, you'll definitely come across these terms. I might refer to them in here as well, so it's good to know the difference. So we talk about plate tectonics a lot in geology. And what a lot of geologists will tell people, and what I've told people, is that the Earth's crust is divided into 20 or so different plates that sort of move around on a mobile mantle. That is not technically correct. It's close. As it turns out, those plates are not just the Earth's crust. It's actually the Earth's crust and maybe a little of the upper mantle. That's a minor distinction. But the term that kind of explains it is something called lithosphere. Anybody want to know what lithos means? If you're in geology, this is a term you come across a lot. Lithos means rock. So this is the rocky, solid, brittle, not only crust, but it includes part of the upper mantle as well. And it's broken into about 20 different solid plates that move around. Now when I say brittle, what do I mean by brittle? What does brittle mean? I know it's a term you've all heard, it's not the easiest term in the world to define, is it? So, all right, so if any of those rocks over on the side there, right? If I whack the crap out of one of those rocks with a rock hammer, if I hit it hard enough, what would it do? It would break. It would break brittly. That's what brittle means, is to break. You said something about malleable. What do you mean by that? It won't break. What, if I had something that was malleable or ductile and I whacked the crap out of it with a hammer, what would it do? It would dent, it would move, it would flow. So the lithosphere behaves like the rocks in our classroom. If you stress them enough, they break. And in fact, they have broken into these 20 or so different plates that vary in size. And then they move on a part of the earth that's more malleable or ductile. And that part is called the asthenosphere. Now the rocks down there are solid. They're not, they're not liquid. But they behave differently because of the enormous heat and pressure that's down there. If you whacked these rocks, if you're able to transport yourself into the asthenosphere, which is the mantle, and whacked it with a big old hammer, it would dent. It would flow, it would deform. It wouldn't break brittily. So these two terms are not really based on the composition of the rock, they're based on the behavior of the rock. How does the rock respond when you stress it? Lithosphere, when you stress it enough, the rock will shatter and break. When you stress the asthenosphere, it moves or flows or dents or deforms. So it's the solid lithosphere sitting over this more deformable, movable asthenosphere that allows plate tectonics to work. That's what lets the solid lithospheric plates move is this asthenosphere that can deform. So you need these two different behaviors to get 
plate tectonics here on Earth. So I know a lot of times when we talk about plate tectonics, we say, oh, the plates are the Earth's crust broken into pieces. It's pretty close. It's mostly crust. But it can also include a little bit of the brittle upper mantle as well. It's a minor distinction, but when you hear these different terms, crust mantle core are more compositional terms. The crust rocks are very different than the mantle rocks are very different than the core. These two terms are behavioral terms. How do the rocks respond when they're stressed? The lithosphere behaves brittly and the asthenosphere behaves plastically. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so we know we have these lithospheric plates, roughly 20 of them. Some are kind of tiny, some are huge and they move. Now, depending on how they move, you're going to get different types of boundaries between the plates. And the Earth behaves very differently at each of these different boundaries. There's different hazards associated with the different boundaries. There's different landforms. So basically, we have three types of plate boundaries. The first one is where two plates move away from one another. They diverge. And these are called, not surprisingly, divergent plate boundaries. Sometimes you hear them referred to as spreading centers because they spread apart. A lot of times they'll be referred to as mid-ocean ridges because most of our boundaries occur where two ocean plates are moving apart. That's just the most common configuration we have here on planet Earth right now. So when these plates move apart, in order for them to move apart, they have to create cracks. And those cracks are really good avenues for magma created in the mantle to come up to the surface. So this is the one plate boundary on Earth that is ridiculously volcanically active. You'll find literally hundreds, perhaps thousands of individual volcanoes along these plate margins, but most of them are beneath the ocean. They're at the base of the sea. We didn't even really know about these until the 1950s. In the 1950s, right after World War II, the US, the former Soviet Union, was massively mapping the seafloor for future war games. You know, they, they knew that a uh, large part of warfare takes place in the ocean. And subs became a big thing during World War II. So they wanted to have these very accurate maps of the seafloor. If you've ever seen uh, Hunt for Red October, a big part of that movie was a sub going right down one of these ridges because they had mapped it so well. But prior to that time, we didn't even really know about these ridges. But there's about 40,000 miles of them beneath the ocean. There are, one way you can think of it is they're the world's longest mountain chain. Very volcanically active because the crust is being pulled apart. Lava is able to seep up from down below. And it forms these little ridges because of all the volcanic and tectonic activity. Okay, so if we have plates moving apart and we know the Earth isn't growing over time, then we have to have places where plates are coming together. And those are called convergent boundaries. Convergent boundaries are where two plates come together and when they collide, the denser plate will slip beneath the less dense plate. Ocean rock tends to be very dense compared to continental rock. So if you have an ocean plate colliding with a continental plate, the ocean plate tends to slip beneath the continent, just as is depicted in this diagram.
And these kind of boundaries create all sorts of hazards. Where that descending plate goes beneath the continent, that's a good site for volcanism. So that's where most of our continental volcanoes are formed. If you go to the Pacific Northwest and see Mount Rainier and Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens, Mount Shasta, Mount Lassen, those are all formed by a small ocean plate that's slipping beneath the northwestern part of the North American plate, creating these volcanoes. You have another one of these systems along the west coast of South America, forming the Andes. The Andes are a volcanic chain. You also get lots of earthquakes in this area. You can get magnitude eight earthquakes, magnitude nine earthquakes. They're also a place where tsunamis are generated. Tsunamis happen when, as this ocean crust slips beneath the continent, sometimes this little lip of the continent gets stuck against it. It starts to get pulled down. And then when there's enough stress built up, that continent will snap back up. And when it's snapped back up, it throws a huge bulge of water up to the Earth's surface, which spreads out in both directions. And that's called a tsunami. And tsunamis roar across the ocean at a speed of about 450 to 500 miles an hour. And these are only maybe 100 or 200 miles offshore. So how long would it take a tsunami to crash into shore in an area like this? We're talking 10 or 15 minutes. So when an earthquake occurs in a place like this, people that live on the coast are immediately warned that there could be a tsunami, but they have like 10 minutes to act. I mean, if you heard right now, you have 10 minutes before a tsunami hits, what's gonna happen? You're all gonna be bolting along with everybody else around here, right? So it can be real panic. So in continental areas, they have evacuation routes set up so that people can get to higher ground really quick. So another hazard that forms in that area because of these moving plates. So you have earthquakes, you have tsunamis, and you get volcanoes. And the volcanoes in these areas tend to be big and explosive. They're not the nice runny lava flow producing volcanoes that you get in Hawaii. These are the ones that produce big ash clouds, dangerous mud flows, real mess. Well, because the Earth is a sphere, and because you have places moving apart, places moving together, inevitably, it doesn't all fit very well, so you end up with places that sort of passively slide past one another. And these are called transform boundaries. Probably the most well-known transform boundary on the planet is the San Andreas Fault in Southern California. So in this diagram on the right, what happens is the left side of the diagram is actually moving up over time, or to the north over time. The left side of the diagram, left side of the fault, is moving to the south over time. You can actually see the fault from the air when you're out in the Mojave Desert, um, east of Los Angeles. Really evident. As it gets up uh, towards San Francisco, it gets lost in all of the human activity and plant growth and stuff, but some places you can see this very easily. These areas are known for pretty large earthquakes. We've had magnitude eight plus. Southern California, as we've talked about, has a huge population. 30 million people live in Southern California. That's roughly one out of every nine or 10 people that live in the US. And this is kind of a constant threat down there. Okay, so three kinds of plate boundaries. Divergent, most of these are in the ocean. We call them spreading centers, mid-ocean ridges. Lots of volcanic activity. We have convergent boundaries where the denser plate will slip beneath the less dense plate. We tend to get lots of explosive volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis in these regions. And then we have these transform places. Some of them are very seismic act active and some of them have no earthquakes associated with them at all. So they're not all 
earthquake prone. Okay, any questions at this point? Again, most of what we're going through in this chapter you've probably seen at some point in time, but I want to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page. So this is just a diagram where it's kind of all put together. You can see the various features going on here. You can take a look at the slides on your own time if you like. Okay, we talked about plates, right? We know the Earth is divided into 20 or so plates, but where? And how do we actually know there's 20 plates? There's no line out there. Nobody's, nobody drew a line on the Earth saying, oh, there's a plate, and there's the edge of another plate. We have been able to deduce that there's plates from the patterns of earthquakes and volcanoes on planet Earth. So the purple dots show earthquakes. Where do you see lots of earthquakes on planet Earth? Do you have lots of earthquakes everywhere? Is the Earth just sort of covered with earthquakes? No, they form in these nice lines and bands, don't they? Where do you see lots of them? Where are some cool bands of earthquakes? So completely surrounding the Pacific Ocean, right? So you've probably all heard of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Well, those earthquakes are all associated with subduction zones that are creating volcanoes and earthquakes. So down here, you have this plate right here, moving to the east, slipping beneath South American continent, forming the Andes. Lots of volcanoes, lots of earthquakes. Up here, you have a plate out in the Pacific, slipping beneath North America. You have plates over here, slipping beneath Asia. Same down here. So you see this whole ring of subduction zones called the Ring of Fire because that's where we have lots of volcanoes on the continents. So besides the edge of the Pacific, where else do you see bands of earthquakes that look kind of curious to you? Yeah, look at northern India, right up here, lots, right? Now remember, that's a place where two continental land masses are coming together. India, which is continental, and Asia, which is coming together, which is continental. And they're coming together. They're the same density. Does either one want to slip beneath the other one? No, so they just buckle and they just crack. There's earthquakes there constantly. One of the worst places on the planet to live for earthquakes. Because there's lots of them, they're big, and where do people live? That is one of the most heavily, densely populated places on the planet. Okay, where else do you see curious bands of earthquakes? Yeah, you got lots over here, but take a look out in the ocean here. Look, here's the Atlantic Ocean. You see a band of earthquakes, right? Where is it in the Atlantic Ocean? It's kind of right smack dab down the middle, isn't it? Anywhere you go, it's kind of equidistant to the adjacent continents, isn't it? And you can see that it extends down into the Southern Ocean as well. So there's this 40,000 mile sort of interconnected band of mid-ocean earthquakes. That's where we think plates are moving apart. So the Pacific plate right here, you see this big plate? It's the biggest plate on the planet. It's enormous. But then you got some tiny plates. One plate here, there's a little plate right there. There's some weird stuff going on in the Mediterranean, some weird stuff going on in the Caribbean as well. So sometimes small plates, sometimes big plates. Geologists argue about the exact number of plates sometimes because it's not totally clear, especially look in Europe just kind of a mass of earthquakes, right? Is that just one plate? Is it a bunch of broken up little plates? We can still argue about some things. There are things that geologists still don't know about the Earth. And then you see the volcanoes are the red dots. You see the red dots are common on some coastlines, but not on others. Here in the United States, we have volcanoes on the west coast, but not much on the east coast. Nothing on the East Coast. Okay, so that's where our ideas of plate tectonics comes from. And this idea of plate tectonics has actually only been around for about 100 years. 
It was first proposed back in the early 1900s by a German climatologist. This guy was looking at past climates and he was down in Antarctica and noticed that there were tropical fossils down there. And he said, well, that's kind of curious. Either the climate has changed or that land used to be in a more tropical area. And then he looked at sort of the patterns of the continents. He said, you know, the continents sort of fit together like puzzle pieces. You look at Africa, South America, North America. If you rearrange them, you could kind of put them all together and they would fit really well together, wouldn't they? So he came up with all this evidence and he said, you know, I think the continents are moving. And that was very different than what geologists thought at the time. And he was just the weather guy, you know? So geologists dismissed his ideas. They laughed him out of town. Basically, though, his problem was he couldn't explain how the continents moved along. He thought that maybe they were sliding over the ocean floor. He called it continental drift. And they said, well, what's going to make a continent move? And he didn't have an answer for it. So his idea was dismissed back in the early 1900s. But then... In the 1950s, when we started mapping the seafloor and seeing all these neat mountain ranges and the ages of the, of the rocks down there, we came up with this idea for plate tectonics, which was very similar to what this guy had proposed 50 years earlier. So sometimes scientists don't get it right the first time. But yeah, so plate tectonics is an idea that's only been around since the 1950s. And it really came to light when we started mapping the seafloor. Okay, so up to this point, we've talked about the Earth, kind of from the surface on down into its great depths. But the Earth is more than just sort of the rocky sphere of a planet. We've got some other zones that are really important as well. Now, one zone that sets the Earth apart from all the other planets in the solar system is what we call the hydrosphere, this sort of water, liquid water envelope that surrounds the Earth. And that's what we're going to spend the next month or so talking about, is the hydrosphere. Roughly 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, mostly in the form of oceans, but we do have large ice caps, Greenland, and Antarctica that are covered by solid H2O, ice. So humans, we tend to think about Earth as the land, but the land is actually the minor component on the Earth's surface. This is a water planet. In fact, when you see like, uh, when you see pictures of the Earth as a sphere, it always shows like maybe North America and South America, or Asia and Africa. Well, you can move the Earth in such a way that if you just looked at the Pacific Ocean, it would pretty much cover the whole globe view. And you never see that because humans find just a giant ocean boring for some reason. But you can do that. I mean, 71% of this planet is covered by water and the Pacific Ocean in particular is just enormous. I went across it in a ship a couple years ago. 21 days. It's awesome. <laughs> it was really amazing. But yeah, it just 21 straight days just steaming across the Pacific to get from Ensenada, Mexico to Japan. Nothing but the big blue. Amazing place. Without this hydrosphere, we would not have life as we know it. All life forms that we have here on Earth, just about all life forms rely on water in some form or fashion. We do have some forms of life that can live without water. We're worried now that with all the probes that we've sent to Mars, that we've actually sent some living organisms that can survive space trip and that we've polluted Mars with some of our own biology. Although there's some people that believe that life on planet Earth actually originated on Mars. So the idea is Mars is a smaller planet, it cooled off quicker, formed life earlier, 
and we have meteorites here on Earth that we know have come from Mars. I'm not going to get into the whole story, but we have meteors that no doubt came from Mars, landed and were picked up in Antarctica. And some people believe maybe there were some microbes that made that journey from Mars and populated Earth. That would really screw up a lot of religious folks who want Earth to be the center of everything. So I really like that idea. I don't know if the evidence is all that strong for it, but it's a really intriguing idea that Mars formed life first and early, and then meteors would be able to bring some of that biologic material here and populate Earth with it. And now we're doing the same. Now we're sending space probes that may have some germs on them as well to Mars. So interesting to think about. So not only does this hydrosphere allow for life, you know, I'm a geologist, I don't care about life. I care about the dead stuff, rocks, things like that. When I'm out in nature and somebody asks me what something is, I can say flower and tree and bug that's about as good as it gets. But if it's dead, I got it. So from a non-biologic standpoint, water is needed because it erodes the surface of the earth. It creates all these great landscapes and landmarks that we have. Our mountains look the way they do because they're eroded by water. <clears throat> the other thing is that water is required for life but it's really required for human life. Not only is most of our body made of water, but we're not very tolerant of a wide range of temperatures. You know, we do really good with moderate temperatures. If it's too cold, if it's below freezing, we don't do so well. If it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we don't do so well. We like our temperatures in a narrow range. And it's actually water that keeps our temperatures from fluctuating far more wildly than they do. If we didn't have so much water, our temperatures would be a lot hotter when the sun is shining and a whole lot colder when the sun isn't shining. In fact, it would be outside the range where we could probably survive. So what it says here is that buffers temperature. To buffer means is to keep it within a narrow range. So water, especially water that's in our air. So most of you think about water, you're thinking about the ocean or lakes or rivers. You have to expand your thinking. Think about water in the atmosphere, in the air. Water in the air, another name for it, humidity, right? So that humidity keeps our temperatures in a range where we can survive, for the most part. And I'll try to explain how this works, because it's a concept we'll come back to a little later in the semester. So when you put water, humidity, into the atmosphere, it narrows the temperature swing that that air is gonna go through. And I'll give you a really good example. How many of you have been to Florida in the summer? What's it like in Florida in the summer? Okay, I used to live in Florida in the summer and I lived in Clearwater, Clearwater Beach, when I was in college worked in a vitamin store. Good times. I would wake up in the morning and be 88 degrees and just humid as all get out. And then by about three in the afternoon, it'd be about 96. So it'd go up about eight degrees. And like you said, just miserable because it's just humid. Usually get a thunderstorm in the afternoon. And then overnight, the temperature would just gradually cool off, just barely. So by the time you wake up the next morning, it's 88 degrees again. So you have about an eight degree temperature swing in this really humid place. How many of you have been to Arizona in the summer? 
I used to live in Arizona, okay? What are the summers like in Arizona? Hot during the day, right? Yeah, I mean, just in the, my brother lives down in Phoenix. I talked to him last week, pretty much every day was over 115. They had a couple days that were up in the 120s. But if you go out into the desert at night, the temperature goes from 115 to 120, way down into the 50s, 60s, sometimes even 40s. You get a temperature swing of about 70 to 80 degrees some days. It's really remarkable. And yet, if you look at a map, Southern Arizona and Florida are right about the same latitude. They get about the same amount of sunlight, but yet their temperatures are so much different, aren't they? I mean, they both get hot during the day, but Phoenix gets hotter. But at night, Phoenix also gets a lot colder, like way colder. And it all has to do with this property of water We call it in chemistry specific heat or heat capacity. It is a property that water has that it requires a lot of energy to warm up. In order to make water warmer, you have to add in tons of, of energy to it. Lots and lots of energy. So if you want the temperature to go from 80 to 90 and you have lots of water in your atmosphere you got to pump in a lot of energy okay so think about florida florida has lots of humidity right so in order to raise the temperature of that humid air you have to have sunlight hitting it all day long and even doing so it only raised the temperature about eight degrees from 88 to 96. now you go to phoenix what's the humidity like in phoenix it's like here, you know, it's like 10%, sometimes it's 5%. So there's not much moisture in the atmosphere, is it? So in order to warm that air up, since it doesn't have water, it doesn't take that much energy. So the temperature goes up really fast because you don't have all this water vapor. Now think about Florida at night. Okay, the sun sets, right? There's no way for the air to warm up. So it's going to start cooling off. So you've got this humidity that sucked up all that energy during the day, right? In order to cool off, what does that air have to do? Has to get rid of that energy, right? But it gives the energy often to the environment, right? The other gases. So you have all this energy that stays in the air at night as the water vapor gives it off. It's like a bank of energy. It accumulates energy during the day, and then it gives it back off at night. And because it gives off the energy at night, the temperatures don't drop very fast. So water has this property called high heat capacity. Sorry, I can't go backwards on this once I start it. So high heat capacity is the property that is responsible for water vapor requiring a lot of energy to warm up and then cooling off really slow at night. So in Florida, you might only have a 10 degree temperature swing, maybe 80 degrees at night, 90 degrees during the day. It's very humid. When the sun shines, all that water vapor sucks in that energy, but because it has a high heat capacity, it warms up very slowly. But then at night when the sun sets, in order to cool off, it gives all that heat back into the air. And it stays pretty damn hot all night long. My wife was just down in Houston last week. She said it was miserable. 100, 102 during the day and humid. Lows are about 85 at night. Wake up in the morning, it's about 100% humidity and it's 85 degrees and just miserable. But it's all because of that humidity, that water vapor. And even at night, it's not a lot better because as it cools, the water vapor releases all that heat into the environment 
So the surrounding air just can't cool off very quick. Okay, we talked about heat capacity, right? All substances have a heat capacity. Would you want a pan for cooking to have a high heat capacity or a low heat capacity? Think about it for a second. What do you think? Let's say you want to fry an egg, okay? I'm gonna go home after class, I wanna fry an egg. Do I want my pan made out of something with a high heat capacity or low heat capacity and why? Who wants to be bold and take a stab? Explain if you can. Okay, that's a really good thought. Okay, so you're saying. Okay, it's actually the opposite, but your thinking's really good on it. Okay, if you have something with a low heat capacity, right? When you add energy in energy, does it heat up slow or fast? Fast, right? Because it doesn't have to absorb much heat for the temperature to change. So it gets up to cooking temperature really fast. Then when you turn off the heat, what will happen to the way it cools? It'll cool off quick, right? If, are your pans made of rock? If you go home and take out a frying pan, is it made of rock? No, it's made of metal, right? Rock has a high heat capacity. So if you took a pan made of rock and put it on your stove and turn the heat on, because it has that high heat capacity, because it has to absorb so much heat, it takes forever for it to heat up. You come back two hours later and your pan probably still isn't hot enough to cook an egg. So you come back five hours later, it's like, finally, damn thing's hot enough, you know? So you put your egg on it, you fry your egg off, and then you turn the heat on, and you come back five hours later and the pan's still too damn hot to touch. So we tend to use things with a low heat capacity because they heat up fast and then they cool off fast. In order to do what you're saying, keep it at a constant temperature, you have to keep the heat really constant, which is easy to do at stoves, but if you're out in the wild, that's really hard to do. So you can think of it as terms of pans as well. I like to think of that analogy. It's like what would heat up quick, what would cool down quick. I made this mistake. You guys I probably mentioned I worked on volcanoes. So about 10 years ago, I was in Hawaii and there's some nice runny rock, molten rock. And I took my rock hammer, I took the pointy end and I pulled out a little glob of rock about this big and I set it aside to cool off. And I went about my business and about an hour and a half later, I picked it up with my gloves because I always wear gloves and stuck it in my pocket really stupid idea because it has such a high heat capacity it just would not give off the heat and even though the outside had cooled a little bit it burned through my pants in about three seconds and left a nice welt on my leg now if that was like made of metal it would have cooled off it was aluminum and it was like this big around that thing would have been stone cold after several hours but because it has high heat capacity it was able to absorb all that heat and then it gives it off really slow so that's bringing this all back. That's what our hydrosphere does in the atmosphere, is it puts this layer of, air, of water into the air that heats up slowly, and cools off slowly, and it keeps our temperatures in a range that human beings can live in. So temperature drop in humid areas is really slow because that water vapor gives off energy as it cools off. Temperatures cool off much faster in the desert because there's not much water vapor. And there's not much heat trapped in that low humidity air. Arizona is the opposite extreme. It gets about the same amount of sunlight, but it doesn't have the humidity to moderate the temperatures. So you can get a 60, 70 
degree temperature swing there, whereas in Florida it might be 6 to 10 degrees. All right, any questions? Okay, another sphere that we have, that we've mentioned a little already, is called the atmosphere. We're not gonna spend much time on it today other than this little tidbit. Our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. So every breath you're taking right now, about four-fifths of that air is nitrogen. Your body doesn't do anything with the nitrogen. So four-fifths of every breath you take, you just blow it back out. 21% of it is oxygen. Now that's the stuff your body wants. You breathe it in, goes into your lungs, the hemoglobin in your blood picks up that oxygen, delivers it to your cells and muscles. Your body goes through this metabolic process where it takes the oxygen, converts it into carbon dioxide. Your blood brings that carbon dioxide back to your lungs and you breathe it out. So from a human standpoint, it's that 21% oxygen that we care a lot about. But there's other things in the atmosphere as well. Lots of other gases. There's sulfur gases. There's a gas called ozone. The oxygen that you breathe in is O2. Two oxygen atoms hooked together. Ozone is O3, three oxygen atoms hooked together. Your body can't use it. But your body will pick it up if you breathe it in, just like the other oxygen. So we have these things called ozone alerts in populated places. Ozone's produced basically by car exhaust. So when we get lots of traffic on hot days, we produce ozone. And it's really hard on people that have respiratory conditions because their body thinks it's regular oxygen that picks it up, but their body can't use it. So in a sense, they're sort of low level suffocating. CO2. CO2 is a gas that's getting a lot of play right now because it's responsible for changing our climate. But we measure it in really tiny amounts. Right now we have about 450 parts per million CO2 in our atmosphere. But that's enough to really change the way the atmosphere responds to temperature. We've basically doubled our CO2 amount since the Industrial Revolution. CO2 is a heat retaining gas, a lot like water vapor. Kind of acts like water vapor. It holds heat and it's responsible for changing our climate right now, without a doubt. All right, magnetosphere. This is one of my favorite topics, actually. It's not a topic that gets a lot of attention. It should get more attention. So I'm going to give it some attention. We're going to give the magnetosphere some love today. We're going to talk about it. All right, let's go back a class period. What is magnetism? What's the definition of magnetism? The force of attraction or repulsion between two objects that have poles or charges, right? So the Earth is a big magnet. So it's going to attract anything that has a pole or a charge. So we have this Earth sitting out in space, and it's a magnet. It's going to attract positive and negative things that are out in space. Well, not terribly far from the Earth, astronomically, is the Sun. And the Sun goes through a process of fusing hydrogen into helium, and it gives off a lot of byproducts. It gives off a lot of charged particles and these charged particles stream out from the sun. We call it the solar wind. So if you're out in space, you're going to have little bitty charged atoms or particles flinging by you. Streaming out from the sun as the sun does its burning thing. 
Well, since those particles are charged, what happens when they come by the Earth? They feel the Earth's magnetic field, right? And the Earth sort of captures them and creates kind of a big shield around it. And that's called the magnetosphere. It's a... You can think of it as a cloak or a blanket of charged particles. And it actually extends out past our moon. Our moon is actually within our magnetosphere. So our moon is protected by it as well. And that's what the magnetosphere does is it actually protects us. It acts as a protective shield against some of the really nasty radiation that exists out in space. Space is a nasty place. It's got x-rays and gamma rays, all these high energy forms of radiation. Human bodies do not do well when they're radiated. Our cells are really susceptible to damage from radiation. Too much radiation, you can get cancer. You can, it can cause mutations. So this magnetic field creates this protective shield called the magnetosphere. And without this magnetosphere, we would have a really hard time surviving because all of that radiation in space would just come storming in here damaging our cells, not a good situation for us. So, when yeah. you say these particles, do you mean like particles from the sun? Yeah, so the sun creates them, and that's what this um, diagram over here on the far left is sort of showing. So it's called the solar wind. As the sun goes through its burning process, it's spitting out all these charged particles in all directions. The ones that come streaming past the Earth feel this attraction repulsion thing going on with the earth as a magnet and it kind of captures it as a big blanket and then those particles that are kind of out there captured reflect things like gamma rays and x-rays cosmic rays and keep a lot of those from coming in here some of them still get through you get hit with x-rays every day from space but at a really low level without that magnetosphere get it at a really high level. Now, for the most part, this magnetosphere is invisible. But sometimes those charged particles can interact, especially near our polar regions, and form the northern lights, if you're in the northern hemisphere, or the southern lights, if you're down in Antarctica. That's actually those charged particles captured by our magnetosphere, our magnetic field, sort of dancing and colliding and exciting each other, creating all these wild patterns. If you haven't seen good northern lights, it's definitely worth trying to go see someday. It's really spectacular. Okay, so magnes magnetosphere is pretty cool. But right now, today, our magnetosphere is doing some wonky stuff. The magnetosphere's been having temper tantrum the last 20 or 30 years. It's not behaving like it did in the past. If you take out a compass, as I'm sure all of you know, that compass needle will point north. That's just what it does, right? It's reflecting our Earth's magnetic field. That's where one of our poles is, so if you have a little charged needle-like magnet, it'll line up and feel that pull of the North Pole. So our compasses will point north. What's kind of cool is there are magnetic minerals and lava flows that are little tiny needles called magnetite. If you go to Hawaii and look at the little minerals that are in the rocks created by the volcano there, there's lots of these little magnetic needles in lava flows. And when they come out on the surface and they're still in the liquid lava, 
they feel the Earth's magnetic field, and they actually wiggle and they point north. Kind of cool. Now, I don't know who discovered this, but some people looking at older lava flows, all of those magnetic needles are pointing south. And then older ones yet are pointing north. And then older ones yet are pointing south. So depending on the age of your lava flow, the magnetic needles might point north or they might point south. What does that tell you? One of two things, either those lava flows have to like flip around from time to time, which isn't going to happen, or our Earth's magnetic pole switch. That doesn't mean the Earth physically flips over. It just means that the positive pole becomes the negative pole and the negative pole becomes the positive pole. We don't know why this happens. It just does. And it does so every so often. How often? Well, in the last couple million years, this pole reversal has happened about over 20 times. It's pretty common geologically. I'll give you the exact figures here in a second. I think 24 times in the last 2 million years. If I'm remembering it right. So we know our magnetic field reverses from time to time. The poles flip. That doesn't mean the Earth physically flips over. It just means the positive pole becomes the negative pole and the negative pole becomes the positive pole. Our compasses would point in opposite directions. 24 in the last 4 million years. So that's 6 every million years. So that's about one reversal every 150 to 200,000 years. What do you want to know? You want to know anything else? Well, what happens during the reversal? Okay, we don't know. We haven't, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. There hasn't been one in recorded history, okay? I'll tell you when the last one was in a minute because you, you should want to know that too. When was the last one? You know, if on average at every 125, 150, 200,000 years. When was the last one? Are we due for one? I'll get to that in a second. What happens during a reversal? Well, like I said, we've never been alive. We've never had a recorded one happen. But we can look at what happens to magnets and labs when we switch the poles. And what we know about magnets and labs when we switch the poles is that for a while, the magnet will lose all of its magnetic field. The magnetic field will drop to zero and then switch. So if you have north, south, in order to go from north to south and switch it over, it has to go to zero, and then the other pole takes place. What happens to the magnetosphere if the Earth is not magnetic for a while? Is it going to capture any of those space things? Are we going to have any protection from radiation? No, so the concern is that for a while, and we don't know how long, is it an hour, is it a day, is it a month, is it a year, is it a decade? We don't know. We might be without protection to space radiation because of our magnetosphere when these switch around. So there's a concern there. Okay? So again, I said there's one reversal every 150 to 200,000 years on average. But here's where the story gets kind of uh, complicated. It's been 700,000 years since the last one. We are so ridiculously overdue for one, it's not even funny. All right, why should we care? Well, several reasons. Now, I don't know how much you know about when humans first arrived on planet Earth in the evolutionary sense. Anybody know how long we've had human beings on planet Earth? 
depends which paleontologist or biologist you ask, but most people agree that the earliest humans, somewhere around two to four million years ago. So have humans survived magnetic reversals in the past? Yeah, we have. What we don't know, though, is are all magnetic reversals the same? Do they all take the same number of days? Maybe these reversals, when humans have come up, are only a few days. Maybe because we've been without a reversal for so long, maybe the next one will take years. Will we survive that? I don't know. It's a question. The other thing is that even if it doesn't kill us, it is going to disrupt your lives in ways that you have a hard time imagining. So we think that during a reversal, the magnetic field probably drops to zero. And if that happens, we lose the protection of our magnetosphere. Gamma rays, X-rays, cosmic rays, all that nasty, crappy space radiation can now enter the Earth and bombard us, radiate us. If it's only a couple days, Sure, we'll survive. It's like sitting in an x-ray machine for a day or two. Not good for you, but you're going to live. Now, if this goes on years, I don't know. You start developing cancers at a higher rate, things like that. But on a more short-term time scale, even if it's just a day or two, it's going to mess you up. Not physically, but... Socially, economically, yeah. How do you know if it's happening? It might be happening. And I'll, next slide, we'll get there. We might actually be at the early stages of one right now. We don't know. But there's some really curious stuff going on with our magnetic field. Its strength has dropped dramatically in the last 30 years and especially in the last five years, and our pole is moving a lot, an awful lot. It's doing some really crazy stuff, especially in just the last couple of years. So today, you living in a developed country and a developed society, you guys are enormously dependent upon satellites. How do satellites affect your daily lives? You probably don't even realize the extent. But what do you use satellites for every single day? Your cell phones will not work without satellites. You're not going to be able to talk to anybody on your cell phone. What else do you use it for? You guys know GPS, Global Positioning System? We use this to navigate planes, cars now. Self-driving cars use this stuff. We use GPS for lots of stuff. That's all based on a huge satellite system. Roughly 30 different satellites out there. Banking, all of those transactions now are wireless. If you go to get gasoline, I can't remember last time I paid for gas with cash. I stick my card in, that whole transaction is done by satellites. Satellites are really, really susceptible to radiation from space. And if we lose our magnetosphere, we are going to fry a lot, probably most, of our satellites. So our communications will be kaput, our banking goes, our GPS system goes by the wayside. Suddenly we get transported back to the 1950s in terms of how we do daily business. It would affect you in a major, major way. The internet comes to a crashing halt. Think of all the stuff we use the internet for. Not gonna work. It's not gonna work. So, I'll show you this video next class, but, 
So here's the position of our North Magnetic Pole over the last 500 years. So back in the 1600s, it was straight north of the northern Canadian shore. And in 100 years, it moved about 100 miles. The magnetic pole has wandered around since we've known about the magnetic pole. And then from 1700 to 1800, it moved about 150 miles. And then from 1800 to 1900, it moved under 100 miles. From 1900 to 2000, it moved about 200 miles. Look what happened between 2000 and 2011. It moved more in those 10 years than in, during a lot of 100 year periods. And now it's moving even faster yet. It's jetting over to Siberia. And the strength of it has dropped over 30%. It's just getting weaker and weaker. Now, does this mean we're going to have a reversal? I have no idea. Nobody has any idea. But it might. So we're now keeping a really close eye on it. You're actually spending a fair bit of tax money to, spend, to study this because we really want to know, is this going to go into reversal? Is it going to happen quick? Is it going to happen slow? What's going to happen with our satellites? What's going to happen with our health? Um, I'll show you a video that sort of encapsulates all of it next class. But I think that's enough for a day. And uh, we'll finish up just a few more things next class and move on and talk about water. Don't forget to take your maps and sign up uh, when you take those, actually. <laughs>